the courses I'm gonna do the I mean the entire course will be based on the the whiteboard lectures. And I hope you don't mind. Let me just enable a few things. Chat box. Okay. Okay, so this course, welcome to CS492, uh, Computational Learning Theory. And this, this, this course is, con is about the learning some theoretical foundations of machine learning algorithms. And I mean, before starting, I want to say that uh, I'm not really an expert on the theories of machine learning. So I'm teaching this course. I mean, the, one of the reason I teach this course is I want to learn about this topic for myself. So throughout the course, I might make a bunch of mistakes and I'm aware that some of you are much better, I mean, has a lot more experience in doing theories on machine learning. So if you spot some mistakes or some inaccurate remarks, or want to add some comments, I mean, all these things will be welcomed throughout the course. Okay, also, if you have any questions, you can always ask them. Uh, in KLMS or in, during the lectures. Okay. Right. So what this course is about, I mean, the, the objective of this course is not to learn a new machine learning algorithms. The objective is to learn the theoretical foundations or you can say theoretical uh, tools behind machine learning algorithms. So that's the objective of this course. And then the course is not really about the learning some of the most up-to-date techniques. So there are lots of work on analyzing stochastic gradient descent or want to understand why neural net generalize well and so on. But this course is not about such, in some sense, fashionable up-to-date theories. The course focus more on the basics. In some sense, old fashioned. But well established techniques. So, okay, the, the course will focus is on the basic old fashioned but well established techniques. So, these techniques, the concepts that you will learn will include, I mean, I'm going to talk about it a little bit, but one big theme in the course will be a generalization bound, which will allow us to say something, may want to say some form of guarantees on the machine learning algorithms. Okay. And then the other things, again, I'm gonna repeat it in, the, in today's lecture. The other big theme that we're gonna learn is uh, techniques for duality. And these are some techniques that you can use to view some optimization problem from multiple different perspectives. And if you view some optimization problem from different perspectives, and they will lead to uh, many different algorithms. And also sometimes, I mean, you, are, you are, maybe if you have some experience with the design of machine learning algorithms, then you might have seen a bunch of terms that appears in so-called optimization objectives in those algorithms, such as regularization and so on. Understanding this duality and also understanding generalization bounds Sometimes it helps us to see where these regularizations come from. I mean, this is not a complete explanation, but it can tell us something about why these regularizations make some algorithm works well. And the uh, entire course will be quite mathematical. So in some sense, because we will go through a bunch of theorems and proofs. So some of you who are not, familiar, I mean, 
might feel that math course, but it's not entirely in the style of the math course because for someone who are more interested in, in some sense, applied mathematics, what's important is not really about the deep theorems. It's more about how to understand some math, how to connect some mathematical statements with what's really going on in practice or in, in the, a particular application domain, in this case, a machine learning. Okay, so these are the objectives and the focus of the course. And I'd like to give you some examples, or maybe some vague examples to illustrate you what kind of thing we're gonna look at in the, throughout this course. So this is not quite example, but very, in a sense, high level explanations about machine learning algorithms and what kind of things we want to look at in, in these algorithms. So here's a very simplistic perspective of it about the machine learning algorithms. So, okay. Now, if the machine learning algorithms, uh, I mean, maybe most of you, when you encounter the machine learning algorithm, you learn about machine learning algorithm as some algorithm, some algorithm that takes examples. Curve view. It's an algorithm. That takes examples. And return something. Okay. And then this, this something can be some context, can be a function. In some other context, it can be a probability distribution. And so on. So and then one important bit about this outcome of this algorithm is that it in some sense does the generalization. Okay. So let's say for, for this discussion, we are thinking about an algorithm that return a function h that goes from some input space x to the output space y. And then these examples are a bunch of input output pairs, x1, f1, so on up to xm. And then when you learn about machine learning algorithms and then the way it works is typically it sets some optimization goal and it constructs H by solving this optimization goal. Now let's take a step back and I mean, we try to ask ourselves what this algorithm really tried to do. Okay. And although for the mechanics or the, the behavior of the algorithm is some optimization over the samples. What this algorithm really tried to do is solving some idealized optimizations over distributions. Okay, so that's this is not an achievable goal because we cannot really optimize this objective. But ideally, what such an algorithm tried to do is the following often. There is some distribution on input output pairs. So this is uh, write it like this probability of times y. This means we have a probability distribution d on the input output pairs. And then what what we really want to. And then there is also a notion about errors. So we, we have a function h that goes from x to y. You can say it's a loss or an error. And there's a function l that compares two elements and typically return some non-negative numbers. It's greater than or equal to zero. And and then what it do, this L does is that how close two outputs are. And then the ideally, what machine learning algorithm want to do is solve this following optimization problem. You want to find some function H in some space of, in the, some set of functions. This H, the, the strange H is a set of functions. In this, this set is called hypothesis set. In this hypothesis set, we want to pick H that minimize the quantity following quantity. And the quantity is an expected, expected error. 
Okay, define the computer and expectations over x comma y. That's sample from D. Where, if you measure the loss of this particular H using this loss, and that's minimized. Okay, so so sometimes, I mean, this work guy is called the risk or generalization error. So this is what we want to do, ideally. But what's the problem? The problem is that we, we have, I mean, there are a bunch of things that make computation not very possible. The first thing is that we don't really have a D. We don't really know this distribution D. We, we have a bunch of some independent sample from the distribution, like X1, Y1, XM, YN, but we don't have this uh, distribution D itself. Okay. The second problem is even when we know D, Optimizing this expectation might become very, very difficult. Okay. This optimization with respect to some distribution, maybe distribution is a highly complicated mixture of Gaussian and so on. Solving optimization exactly for this distribution, even when we know the distribution, it may become super difficult. Okay. So and so on. There are multiple problems. But let's, let's think about the first problem. We don't know D and we want to solve this optimization problem. In some sense, we don't need the optimization goal and we only have a partial information about the distribution in terms of samples. And based on this sample, we want to solve this optimization problem. So what people typically do, and uh, the people, what people do, um, I think sometimes, <laughs> Uh, Microsoft OneNote of some synchronization issue. Okay. okay. So what typically do? They typically pick instead of this real objective that I put as a is R of H, they pick a proxy objective. They want to, they have uh, some proxy object that can be computed. This R of H cannot be computed because we don't know D and uh, this expectation may be very hard, I mean, very difficult quantity to compute, even if we know D. But the, so typically machine learning algorithm can think about proxy objective, our head of D. Uh, so we write, this set of examples as a as say uh, use capital S to denote this set or sequence of input output pairs and we call this as samples. Or sometimes in machine learning this is called training set, but we following the terminology of the textbook we call it S S as a sample and X Y pairs as an example. Okay. So instead of Thinking about this original objective, typically machine learning algorithm consider the proxy objective. Okay. One of the common proxy objective is R head of S. That's defined like this. It's a it's an average over all the examples in the in our sample. I is a one equal to M. And then we take an average loss over examples. Because H, we can compute it. L, we can also compute it. And this average can also be computed. So this is a kind of quantity that we can compute. So at least we are in a situation where we can compute the objective of the optimization. And, and then the typical algorithm solve this proxy optimization problem with respect to this proxy. I mean, this is sometimes called empirical risk minimization. So typically, it, it can change the objective, but uh, in a simplest case, what it does is that it compute this quantity. Uh, let's just write it. Uh, I don't know. So the algorithm works by solving this proxy. 
So then the then the, the next one natural question is now we instead our real objective is solving the one above, but we instead solve this proxy objective. So, so suppose that we solve this proxy objective and get a very nice solution. Say, suppose H of S is the solution of proxy objective But this is not really we want to say. We want to say something about the original objective. And what can we say about the, the quantity that we really care about, which is R of HS. Okay. So this is closely related to the inductive generalization. So the sample, I mean, the, the, the sample S or the sequence of input output pairs that we are given, they are the examples. And the algorithm, in a sense, works by looking at these examples and coming up with uh, some function that maps, that, uh, in a sense, describe this, these input output pairs well. However, what we really want to say is something that about the underlying probability distribution. So, we want to generalize from a few examples and then want to say something about the underlying distribution. Can you really say this? And how, I mean, we want to be mathematical, how we can even formulate a theorems that, that let us connect what's really going on in this sample object, the proxy optim outcome of this proxy op optimization and the outcome of the real optimization that we care about. So that's the kind of one natural questions that, that can arise in this context. And this is the question, in fact, what we I mean, we try to answer by studying this in this course. The second question is, we, I mean, we have this proxy objective. This, I mean, let's call this as a one, or two. Now we have this proxy objective, but sometimes solving this proxy objective might become quite difficult. Okay. How can we solve two? Okay. Two at least looks, I mean, it's, it can be computed, various quantities can be computed, but the optimization problem involved in with our proxy objective might itself be a, become a very hard optimization problem, which requires exponential time and so on, then we can't really do it, okay? And com to come up with a realistic machine learning algorithms, we need uh, some polynomial time algorithms. So how can we solve two, uh, I mean, two efficiently? And if two is very hard optimization problem, can we further approximate it such a way that it have a nice, uh, I mean, it allows the reasonably efficient algorithms for, solving it or approximately solving it. So these are the kind of questions that they can arise in the context of the machine learning. And then they are the questions that we will study in this course. So for let's, yeah, yeah I want to tell you a bit about the, what we're gonna learn, which will kind of help us to address number one and number two. And one big theme that we're going to learn throughout the course is something called the generalization bound. And what, yeah, what sam you can say sample complexity bound and generalization bound. These are the same thing. And generalization bound. They are closely related to our the, the first question that I raised, which is we which is this we solve proxy optimization problems. What can you say about the original optimization problem? Okay. And also related to the inductive generalization. Okay. Then so the I mean in our learning theory, it formalized this uh, relationship. I mean in some particular way. 
and that's formulated by this, this generalization bound and sample complexity bounds. In the most easiest case, I mean, the, what we're going to learn in the next lecture, which we're going to learn something called the PEC learning framework. And then that PEC learning framework is also an instance of this style of I mean, generalization bound, which behave particularly nicely. Okay. And what this bound actually looks like, uh, by the way, I, I mean, just my personal view about learning uh, new topics or new, maybe it can be a branch of mathematics or maybe some branch in theoretical computer science and so on. I mean, my personal view is that the one important bit is to understand what kind of questions this, this field is asking. Okay. So they are the, each, each of the field try to formulate the question, try to form, especially in application area, try to formalize some aspects of the application and try to formulate the theorems that captures these some aspects of the application area. So the, the first things that that's quite needed is to get used to the style of the theorems and be able to understand some, in, extract some intuitions out of the theorem. You can th think of the statement of the theorem as very compressed expression about really what's really going on. So from, I mean, in some sense, I, I mean, one good way to understand an area is to be a good decoder of this compressed expression. Okay, so what, so I want to give you some flavor about the, how, what the theorem actually look like. So this is a theorem in the textbook. Eleven point eight. That theorem is about generalization bound on regression. So, I mean, regression is nothing but is a problem of learning functions that goes from x to y, but it make a big assumption which is. It assumed that the y is equipped a notion of I mean, something like a distance. So if you say y doesn't have any structure, I mean, and finite, it becomes a, a so-called classification problem. Typically in the regression, y has a, I mean, y is infinite, like a set of reals, but the more important part of the regression is She's also explained in the textbook is that it had some structure, which is the notion of distance, and that plays a very important role in the in the context of learning. But that's the regression problem. And the generalization bound to say something like this under some condition. And it's a so don't worry so much about quantification, okay, for epsilon, delta, no, epsilon. So M is the number of samples and that delta is the prop, uh, bound on the probability, say something like this, probability. One over delta divided by ten. That is greater than or equal to one minus delta. Or some C one C two. So this H here is uh, is a set of functions, specific set of function from which we want to find. Uh, we want to pick one. We want to. I mean, from from which we want to. Uh, we want to pick one based on the example. So this is called hypothesis set. 
mean. So, so what it it it, it contain it's really the space of uh, what's gonna be constructed by the learning algorithm. And then R of H is exactly what I told you before. That's an error that with respect to the real distribution, the real distribution talk about input output pairs. And this R hat of subscript S of H is again, what I explained to you before, it's a proxy objective. I mean, the proxy quantity that I told you, so based on the sample, we compute the each loss. And because S is, I mean, S here is random. And that's why this entire thing uh, is, so this, this entire thing is probability. So the probability is over S, that is sample from independent sample of input output pairs from distribution D. So that this quantity, depending on the sample, if there is, okay? So what this, this style of the theorem really tells us, theorem tells us that we want to, so this is a quantity that we care about, and we want to bound that quantity using the quantity that we can measure using samples, okay? But because the quantity we can measure, I mean, it can be off. So we want to put some approximate, uh, some gap and want to upper bound because this is a, related to an error. We want to upper bound with some, by putting some extra bits here. And now this entire upper bound, I mean, ideally we want this entire upper bound to be true always, but they cannot be done. I and mean, we may be unlucky. So, so that this S, the set of samples we, we get here, I mean, here, maybe very unrepresentative of the typical input output pairs. In that case, we may fail. But what we are expecting is this type of very untypical scenario will happen with very low probability. So all we can say about the upper bound is the, our estimates plus some extra quantity, upper bound the quantity that we care about here with very high probability. So that's the typical statement of the theorem. We want to bound the quantity that we care about, in this case, R of H, with a quantity that we can measure plus something extra. And we, but because of the randomness involved, all we can say is that that upper bounds hold with a certain probability. So that's the typical form of the, uh, of the theorem. It, I mean, this upper bound is something sometimes called uh, approximately correct. I mean, it's related to approximate the correct part in so-called tech learning. And this probability part is related to probably in the part in the PEC learning. Okay. So, so this is upper, in a sense, approximate upper bound. No, probable upper bound is, is what we this theorem is telling us. Ah, yes. So we can always get a sample complexity bound from the generalization bound quite easily. So we're gonna look at it more closely. I mean, we will uh, look at this when we talk about the pack one. Okay. Now there are a few things in this theorem that we uh, I want to to notice. The first thing is that the use of universal quantification. Okay. So there is a universal quantification here. So this is called the uniform bound. Okay. So if you look at this bound, the bound doesn't say anything about the algorithm. So in some sense, the entire theory is developed by decomposing the design or guarantee of the algorithm into two parts. The first part is designing, showing this type of a uniform bound, which say with high probability, this upper bound is true for everything in the hypothesis set. So that separates out the optimization part. Whatever optimization you do, I mean, this bound will always be true, okay? So, so we prove this bound for all H, which is called uniform bound. The second, the quantity that we have, there are two extra bits that we add in the, in the upper bound, and they have some meaning, okay? The first part, I mean, we're gonna look at it later. The first part is closely related to complexity. My use of color is very confusing, but this part is very much related to the complexity of H. 
the, our hypothesis set. Okay, so our hypothesis set is really simple, and the quant this the, this sec second sum end on the upper bound will become very small quantity. Okay, and mathematically, this quantity comes from the use of so-called uniform bound in the in in the during the proof, but it's related to the complexity of H. So if H is a simple, we have a tighter bound. The second quantity is related to the sample approximation. So, so what I mean is, I mean, later we will show that this R head of H, R head S of H, it's a reasonably good approximation of RH. It's random, but I mean, you, 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 there is some sense that it's a reasonably good approximation. For example, if you take an expectation over all those, all the sample, possible sample here, then on average, that's the right answer. Okay, so this is called unbiased estimator. So it's a good estimate, but because it's an estimate, there is an error, okay? And then this, the second part is about the, I mean, it's, it's there to account for the possible errors that's caused by, uh, in, in this sample-based approximation. So the, the last bit is approximation coming from the approximation error for a single H, and then the well, per H, and then this, the, the middle term is really coming from the complexity of this H. Okay. Right, so, so that's the sample complexity bound or generalization bound that we're going to look at. And the theorem has of this form. And uh, the other part that we're going to look at about is related to this uh, second question, how we can solve optimization problem. And we will look, develop various tools. And the, the tools that we'll look at are kernels. So, so that this is a mathematical construction closely related to what you learn from functional analysis. So we're gonna talk quite a bit about Hilbert space and so on. But algorithmically, what it does is that it, it, it's a binary function that tell us how similar two quantities are. Okay. And you can think of this as a generalization of the inner product in some sense. So it's a binary function that uh, tells us how to, similar two things are. And then the, the duality that I'm going to talk about soon, I mean, together with the duality, it becomes a I mean, really important ingredient of designing a, a machine learning algorithm. And that's because Often the machine learning algorithms can be re-expressed in terms of just comparing the relationship between two different inputs. Okay. So the corner is one thing that we're gonna learn and that will form a very important uh, tool for solving some optimization problems. The other is duality. And the duality tells us some we, we I mean we can reformulate the optimization problem that we solve in the, in the in two different well, multiple different forms, and this dual view, uh, together with the kernels, sometimes give us uh, I mean some different algorithms, or sometimes led, led us to the computations even when the original form doesn't really allow us to do any computation at all. So for duality, we will look at especially convex duality. And then in the differentiable case, if the objective is differentiable, or well, well, constraint is reasonably differentiable, we will look, look at technique based on Lagrangian. And then if the things are not differentiable, we will look at bench duality. Especially, potential duality play an important role when you learn about maximum entropy principle, I mean, the model, the learning probability model based on the maximum entropy. Okay. So, I mean, 
Okay, what should I say? Okay, let me just tell you about the, what this whole thing is really tell us. So if you think about the learning of function from x to y, suppose x is just Euclidean space. Oh, well, yeah, suppose it just x is a Euclidean space. Okay. And y is just a set of real, okay? And then we have a bunch of examples. So say we have x1, and there we have a value, y value, which is, say, 1. We have x2, there is a y value, which is 2, maybe x3, y value 3, and so on, x4, maybe in this case, minus 1, so on. So we have a values like this, for examples. The, and then the one way to learn an algorithm is we want to solve some optimization problem, and then we define a function f. We, for instance, So these are the inputs, and how we can go about solving the learning some function, h, that lives in this space. One way to do it, one way to define h is by linear function. So we find w such that our h of x is defined by inner products of w and x. So that's a typical linear regression scenario. In this case, the what algorithm does is that it computes W. Okay? And then using the examples that we are given, okay? using the sample S view that we are given here. Now, this is a one style of the algorithm, but the different style of the algorithm is in some sense remembers all these examples. Okay, So it defines H as follows. So whenever you we get some new inputs, say x here, we can compute the distance from x to x1, and the distance is maybe two, distance x to x2, which is a three, and distance x to x, x3 is maybe four, maybe six. And then based on the distance, it compute the weight to the average. I mean, this is a particular scenario, but I mean, we can think about this type of an algorithm given an x. We, we remember all the samples somewhere. Given x, we compare x with all the inputs that we stored in the, in the sample. And then based on the comparison, we combine the, the quantity. So I mean, 2, 3, 5, 11, 15. So the way it output is computed is we have a 15, 2. Um, this is not quite right, but uh, I mean, this is very bad algorithm, but let's just do the, this bad algorithm here. Plus 15 plus three times two, 15 plus six times minus one. I mean, it's really bad, but give us some idea. So we can design an algorithm like this. We, we store all the examples whenever the example comes in, and then we do some comparisons. And based on the comparison, we find a way to combine the outputs, like one, two, three, minus one in the example. I mean, this is that, but this is one example of this. So, so you can design an algorithm in this way. So now the question becomes, how are these two styles of the algorithms are related? And see that the second algorithm, it remembers or examples, and use them during prediction. The first doesn't do this. Okay, how do these two things are related? And then it turns out, although these two things look very different, they have a very close relationship. And then this duality really tells us how these two things are related to each other. Uh, and then the corners play an important role because it's, it gives us some, I mean, here I, the notion of distance is not quite right. I should have, should have used the similarity. Corner can be used to measure the similarity. And so it can help us to design an algorithm in the style of number two. 
And uh, right. Okay, so these are the things that we will learn. And let me just give you, maybe some of you already quite kind of used to the many machine learning algorithms. There's just something, maybe some outcomes, so, or some insight that you can gain by doing all these study. One things that you can gain, I mean, is that um, I mean the so by learning these tools and analysis. And gain some insight. into existing MN algorithms. So what's the I mean, what's the example of this? The example is a regularization. So I said the typical ML algorithm solve optimization problem but sometimes so suppose our set of function is really just a linear function. So it takes x and map it to inner products of x to y. Here w is some input space. Okay, let's use i to space. Okay. And, and that's a typical scenario. And then the the optimization that I described before. And now, because all the functions in H are parameterized by W, it can be written like this. And then say, we have uh, our sample hat together with this type of function, X. But, so that's the exactly the copy of what I explained to you before. But typically, we also put something extra, like lambda of so L to me, the square of the L to norm of W. So if you are not familiar with L to norm, this is nothing but the sum of all the weights, squares, sum of squares of all the weights. Right. Okay. So then, the, I mean, maybe if you played with machine learning algorithms, Perhaps I have an experience that putting this type of regularization give a, I mean, help you to get a better, I mean, they learn some, some better functions from examples. So then the question is why that is the case. And there may be multiple reasons about why this type of regularization help. Regularization appears in here, but in many other contexts. Okay. W. So this type of regularization appears in many different contexts. And then the what you will learn, actually say, tell us a bit more about I mean, why this regularization is helping. Uh, I mean, there are multiple answers. So what I'm telling you is just one answer, I mean, one partial answer, which doesn't always apply, but sometimes applies. But the answer from the gen, uh, this generalization bound to tell us, Tell us is that if W is small, then our, let's write it like this, our functions defined by W, with this, uh, this is the estimate of the real error. I mean, this becomes, this approximation by the sample becomes better. So what, is, what you can say with the guarantees that we have for this for these approximations and the, the, the error of this approximation here is better. I mean, into, you can understand this intuitively. So I suppose think about a setting where i is equal to one. So this h, each of the element h in h, 
just a very simple function h of x is wx, some constant w. But now suppose that w, value of w is bounded between minus 1 and plus 1. So, some other sync problem. Okay, let's just say again. So, think about the case where i is equal to 1, and the function x in this case is just some constant multiplied to the input x. Now, if w is between minus 1 and 1, the possible value of h is, I mean, if Suppose that we only care about x, which is between, say, minus 2 and 2. Then we can even say the this h of x is bounded. I mean, because the worst case we can get is minus 2 times 1. It's minus 2. And then the, the largest case, possible case is number 2. So we can even say the, the h of x is bounded. So with if w is really small, then because h of x, the, the possible value of h of x is becomes a kind of constrained more, it becomes easier to estimate this real errors with, with, with based on this sample. So this approximation that we, we have here becomes easier. And so, but one explanation about how regularization helps is that it makes our estimations, this estimation problem of estimating this generalization error R of H of W using the sample R head of S become the, making this estimation problem a lot easier. So that's why the, these things are behaving a bit better. So that's a one explanation. The other explanation, maybe some of you who already saw derivation of support vector machine and dual version about this. I mean, you can understand this that this W comes from duality. But uh, I mean, later in, in one instance of the duality for, for max entropy. learning case. In this case, it will tell us that, I mean, this W is really coming from constraints. So in Bex entropy learning case, what we learn is a probability model. Okay, so we are not learning input output pair, the function from input to output. In this case, we are trying to learn a probability model. In this case, this the regularization is really coming from a constraint. Which say that expectations of learned probability model should be within certain range. Expectation of some quantity. So the point I'm making is that by learning all these things like uh, duality, generalization bound, and so on. You can gain a better understanding about what the, the this where this regularization comes from, what kind of role it plays. But from generalization bound perspective, it makes this a sample based estimate of the real error becomes a lot easier. And then in, from the duality perspective, it's an encoding of some uh, constraints that we impose in our learning problem. Okay, so that's the kind of overview about the course. This. Then now I want to tell you a bit about the logistics of the course. So the plan is to of the course is to cover Plan is to cover chapter two to six and 
chapter 11 and 12 of the textbook. And chapter two to six are mostly based on the, re the classification problem. But the purpose of going through this chapter are learning some tools like uh, generalization bounds, uh, concept related generalization bounds such as pack learning, Radamaka complexity, and there's a very general generalization bound for when the, all the hypothesis functions are bounded. So we're going to prove that kind of theorems. And also we will learn about some techniques involved in model selection and support vector machine and the kernel method. And the reason we look at support vector machine is not because I mean we are particularly interested in the support vector machine, but because support vector machine is a very specific instance. I mean, in some one of the best instance where theory has a very nice theory. So we will focus on so-called margin theory that try to explain why support vector machine behave very well. Also, it's a good instance of the duality. Chapter 11 and 12, they are mostly about the regression and the learning, so learning functions and learn from to the reals and also learning probability model. And then they have, will have some different flavor. So this is a max entropy learning. And then the, some new things is that, I mean, we will, you will see that bunch of generalization of what you learn in, from chapter two to six in the context, in the setting of chapter, chapters 11 and 12. So that's our plan. And the exact schedule or tentative schedule of how we're gonna proceed will be, is described in the course web page. Okay. And you, you can find the information about course web page. Ah, so Occam's razor is related to the managing the complexity of the of, of the hypothesis set. Yes, it's related to the I mean Latamaka complexity is related to the Occam's ratio. Okay. Now the for the seconds, we the evaluation of the course will be based on the three main components. I'm not going to do attendance check. I think this is almost graduate level course. So I expect students to be so-called self-regulated learners. So if you, you can attend the lectures, if you think it's useful, I mean, you can skip it if you think it's not useful. I mean, it's all okay as long as you learn what you are supposed to learn in the course, okay? And then the, but if it's gonna be based on two to three homeworks, homework assignments. So they will account for 40%, which is quite a lot. So, and likely there may be two homework assignments or possibly three. So the problem, the, re, the re, reason that we don't give more homework is because, I mean, marking homeworks is, takes a lot of time, but we only have one TA. So this, this is one component. So they, we also are gonna have a final exam Depending on the situation of COVID-19, we may have, uh, I mean, if it goes very well, we might have a, this, the offline final exam. If it's not possible, then we may have a take-home exam. So, I mean, I think the situation will become clear maybe in the middle of the course. By that time, I will make an announcement about how we're gonna arrange the final exam. The third component is a critical survey. So this is an opportunity that you can learn about uh, the most recent topics in, in machine learning. So the critical the survey, I mean, it goes like this. Students go to a conference webpage. There's something called the CORT, which is a computational learning theory conference. This is one of the best conferences in computational learning theory. And the past four years of the CORT, I think it's CORT 18 to 21. Then what you have to do is you have to pick one paper. But I want you to do more than just summarizing one paper. I want you to study 
the topics or problems start the kind of tackled in the in the paper. So and this is I want want you to do is in-depth survey. into topic of the paper. Of course, the, your survey should talk about what are the results of the paper and what's the contribution and why you think that contribution is important. You may say the contribution is not very important, then you should form an argument which say why it's not very important. Okay. And then the exact evaluation criteria is described on the course webpage. And there are two reports I want you to submit. The one report is, I think this is, although I wrote formulated as a survey, you can think of it as it's a self-study project. So I want you to write a proposal, which is going to be almost one page, excluding bibli bibliography. The proposal describe uh, what you, which topic you want to study, and then the I mean, how, what, what are the kind of things you're going to look at, how you're going to spend your time and so on. Essentially describe the overall plans for, and then also give us some rough idea about what kind of things, topics, and what, what kind of survey you're going to write. And then there is the actual survey, which will be uh, at, at most four pages. It doesn't have to be four pages, but it's just at most one, four pages, okay? And excluding bibliography. The proposal will account for 5%, survey will account for 15% of the total marks. And the deadline is first one, the proposal is the 29th of October, and the survey is the 3rd of December. And you can should be able to find the submission boxes in the KLMS. I created them, and I mean, if you are done, then you can even submit in maybe next week. And so. Okay. And then the one last bit is that the uh, teaching step. So I'm Hong Sok Yang, and then I'm Hong Sok, and then my email I'm using Google email Hong Sok zero zero at gmail dot com. And my office hour office hour is in June right, because of the COVID-19, but of my office hour is from six to seven on Monday. And then TA is Sang Im. And you should be able to find information about this email and so on in the course web page. The course web page, you can find a link to the course web page in the KLMS. Uh, just in case it's in GitHub, let's uh, which, yes, Com and so minus L and CIT twenty nine. Okay, so that's the course reference. Oh. Um, uh, let me mention two more things and to finish. And then throughout the course, we will take a very strict honor code. So this means that uh, violation of honor code means F. So in the past, actually, there was a student who got F because of the violation from different course, but we will adopt the same policy. And so violation means Something that you can you are already familiar with, so it's like a copying some. I mean the solutions for answers from the friends 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 solutions for other sources. But there's an, another important bit, which I mean, you may be less familiar with, especially you are an undergrad student. This is called plagiarism. So in the past, I, when I give a similar kind of uh, this essay style exercise, 
I found that some students who just cut and paste the, the, some, some textbook or some paper, okay? That is called plagiarism, okay? So if you copy texts uh, from textbooks, papers, and so on. So that's called plagiarism. And if you really want to use some sentence from existing textbooks or papers, you have to rephrase them and then have to clearly state that, that, that I mean, clearly state the source of the, the text and sentences. Okay. But ideally, I mean, if you just do all these things, then it's not really your write-up. Your write-up should be based on your own thought and your own words and phrases and so on. Okay. But if, if you cannot avoid using texts, I mean, then you can, uh, I mean, you can, you have to rephrase them and then use them. In the math text, it's a bit different. If something, something is an official definition, like, uh, I mean, the te definition of a peg, I mean, you can use the official definition. I mean, it's just an official definition, just you are using it. That part is fine. But, I mean, the, sometimes I saw that some students just cut and paste the theorems in the paper in his summary report. That is also sounds, I mean, looks very, not very nice, okay? I mean, it's a maybe borderline plagiarism, but it's, it's, it, it doesn't look uh, professional right now. Okay, so the final bits, you know, final comments of today's lecture is that, as I said, I'm not really an expert, so help me. The, when, whenever I make a mistake or some, something is not clearly explained and so on, also, if you know something much better than I do, I mean, you can add a comment or some further explanation. I would really appreciate it, okay? And then the, the other thing is that uh, the textbook, if we are using textbook foundations of machine learning, and this textbook is a second edition, this textbook is good, but it has lots of typos. I mean, maybe not lots, but quite a bit of typos. And sometimes, I mean, in my case, when I read the textbook, I couldn't, I felt some theorems are stated incorrectly, okay? But so what I want you to think about, but what also sometimes like a setup is changed on the fly and so on. So what I want you to do is that, I mean, if you try to just read this textbook literally, you may get confused and become, I mean, frustrated because of typos and you can't really understand what's really going on. So instead, I want you to, I mean, I, I know that all of you are very smart. So I want you to focus on what the author tried to say. If you think you cannot really understand what you feel like something is not quite right. And if you take a step back and think a little bit, then you should be able to fix most of the typos for yourself. And then some theorem or statement, if you find there are just some gaps, then you, you could step back and think about it. Then you can also be able to fill in those gaps. So be a smart learners who try to understand, see that what's the, what these authors really try to say in certain theorems. If you think that theorems are not exactly correct, try to fix them in one way or, or another. Throughout the lectures, if I find some mistakes in the books or errors, I'm gonna, try to present a fixed version, I mean, my bug fixed version, but I might have, have I might miss something. And in that case, I mean, I want to be a, a, a good reader who is able to fix some of these errors. Okay, so that's it for today. And so thank you all for coming. I'm gonna stay here about 10 more minutes. So if you have any questions that you can ask me. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you.